thank you all for coming out. I know everyone has like 20 different things to do on a Sunday afternoon, so thank you very much for, for coming. This is wonderful. Um, this is kind of a monster topic, and I've got a, I'm, I'm planning on covering a lot of stuff. That said, I'm very open to questions, so if anyone has questions or um, you know, just pop your hand up. If I'm talking too softly or too loudly, pop your hand up. Just I just ask that people not throw things. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, if, if your question is one that's going to take a long time to answer or if I'm coming to it as I'm talking, I'll just let you know uh, so that we can try and cover as much as we can in the time we have. Um, so when we're talking about senior pets, this is something that you know, we, you know, is near and dear to most of our hearts because many of ha either already have, have right now, or have had senior pets, or we are working with, with senior pet populations. And they do have um, a lot of special considerations and, and, and special care that, uh, that we worry about. So first thing that we want to talk about is what is senior? Um, now, when I was in veterinary school a long time ago, um, any dog or cat over the age of seven was considered senior. That has since changed, and while there's no official scientific consensus, this is, this is what most people agree on. Uh, under a year of age, juvenile, one to six years old, adult, uh, six to ten years old, mature. If you have a lab, this is when they might start uh, <laughs> slowing down a little. Probably not. Um, and if they're over, if we're over 10 years old, this is where we are geriatric. Um, so for purposes of our talk today, uh, we're going to consider dogs and cats over the age of 10 uh, to be senior or, or geriatric. Um, and so what are some of the normal aging changes that we may expect to see when, when our animals are getting up to this age and, and over this age? Well, the first thing that, that we know happens is that the senses start to diminish. We can't measure or ask about taste or touch. We, we think that smell it hangs on the longest and probably diminishes the least. Uh, the senses that we can observe, vision is the most obvious. And, uh, and one change that pretty much we, every senior animal is going to go through is on the left here, nuclear sclerosis, which is just a fancy term for the lens of the eye getting thick. And as we get older, our lens gets thicker, which is why we all wear reading glasses. Um, and in dogs and cats, that thickening of the lens um, starts to be visible as this kind of vague grayish or bluish haze in the pupil of the eye. Many people will look at that and say, oh my gosh, my animal's getting cataracts. And it can look very similar to cataracts. The difference between nuclear sclerosis, though, and cataracts, cataracts can also be an age-related change. Not all animals are going to get cataracts, though. Pretty much all of them are going to get nuclear sclerosis. The difference between them, um, you're, you're probably not going to be able to tell when your animal's at home. But me in the office with my fancy ophthalmoscope, I can tell the difference when I look in the eye. With nuclear sclerosis, I can see through that thickening. I can see all the way back to the back of the eye, to the retina, and it looks crystal clear. And that's one of the main differences between nuclear sclerosis and cataracts, because nuclear sclerosis, although it's getting thicker, light can still easily pass through. If light can pass through it, the animal can see. So with nuclear sclerosis, there generally is not much of a problem with vision. It does get more prominent as the animals get older, and a 15-year-old animal is going to have much more prominent, uh, that bluish haze, than a 10-year-old. And as it gets more prominent, these animals might start getting problems with night vision. I tell my clients this a lot. My animals, when they start getting this, uh, or when it becomes advanced, they don't want to go up and down the stairs at night without the landing light being turned on, because they, they start to have trouble with night vision. But day vision is usually fine. But the difference with cataracts is cataracts are opaque. They block light. And so if I look with my ophthalmoscope, now I'm seeing something in the way. The good news about age-related cataracts is that they rarely get to the point of blindness. So cataracts that are associated with disease many times will become what we call mature or full cataracts. And it's like closing a shutter on a window. It completely blocks the light. No light is getting to, into the eye, and therefore the animal cannot see. Most age-related cataracts stay what we call immature, meaning that light is still getting in. The animal can still see, but their vision may be diminished. They may not recognize you from a distance. 
you may throw the ball and they're like, what? Where? <laughs> you know, it's like, so, um, so there may be that. But full blindness, fortunately, is not usually the case with age-related cataracts. Uh, hearing. I'm sure this looks familiar to anybody who has had a very elderly dog or cat. If you have, how many people want to go wake this dog up? Because they sleep so soundly. Their hearing diminishes. They start sleeping very soundly. And I'm sure you've all had this experience. You're like, you come home. Your dog doesn't hear you. You're like, Rusty. Rusty. And then you're like, Rusty. Ah, rubber. Fire. Wow. And you're like, it's time for dinner. Food. Yeah. OK. You know, and they just, it startles you. It startles them. You know, like, oh my god. So yeah, we'll just let him sleep. We're not going to wake him up. Hearing definitely goes down, of course, with age. The interesting thing, especially with dogs, we notice this, although I have seen it in one of my cats, is that we start, we, and I joke a lot with my clients about the selective hearing. You know, they're getting about 11, 12 years old, and you're like, time for your bath. And they're like, what? Um, but they can hear the cookie jar three rooms away. Yeah. yeah. The interesting thing that I have found, though, with my own animals and with my clients' animals, and I've seen it enough now over 24 years of practice, I'm fairly confident of this, if you're starting to see selective hearing, that will progress into full hearing loss at some point. So uh, I don't know why they can still hear. It must be it's a certain frequency of the cookie jar that they can still hear that. I don't know how that works. Um, but, but selective hearing, and I'm sure there's a little bit element of stubbornness along with that. But, but these guys will go into full hearing loss. Generally, what we're looking for in the exam room is we're making sure there's not big wall balls of wax that are blocking the ear canal, making sure, of course, there's not ear infections. But if everything looks you know, fabulous in the ear canal and the eardrum, it's just age-related hearing loss. Um, cognition, um, <laughs> this is one of my favorite things. I cannot brain today, I has the dumb. This is me on any given Monday morning. Um, <laughs> Uh, MRI studies in dogs, these studies, as far as I know, have not been done in cats, but MRI studies in dogs have shown that geriatric dogs, we presume the same as for cats, um, undergo the same changes, brain changes, that geriatric people do. Their brains get smaller. We know that cognition goes down. This isn't to say that you, you certainly can still teach an old dog new tricks. Absolutely. I've done it. But I think where it translates on a practical level is that the older the animal gets, especially if we're getting very elderly, we're getting up into you know, 15, 16, and, and above, these animals seem not to have the resilience that younger animals do. And so if, especially if there's big changes in their schedules or their, in their routines, um, we, we have to handle with care because they, they don't have the woohoo, yay, we're moving across the country, you know, that a three year old is going to have. It's like, where's my dog, where's my food bowl? You know, where's my water bowl? Why are you doing this to me? Kind of thing. And I think they just aren't processing quite as well. Um, I don't have a slide for the next point because uh, it's hard to show metabolism on a slide. But metabolism can start to get less efficient. And where we may see this, is especially in, in, the, in the making of proteins. The body may become less efficient in its handling and making of proteins in particular. And in very elderly animals, we may see this as a slight loss of, of muscle mass, that we might start to get a little bit of, of muscle loss. I emphasize slight and I emphasize very elderly because we're going to be talking later about weight loss and, and muscle wasting. <coughs> and, uh, a lot of these things that we're talking about are like where, you know, where is normal and where is abnormal. So that can be a normal change as we're getting up into very elderly animals where their metabolism just isn't as efficient anymore. So all these things that we're talking about, you know, senses diminishing, cognition in, in very elderly animals may be diminishing. We will be talking about cognitive dis dysfunction later. Um, metabolism getting a little less efficient, things like that, can translate to decreased activity overall, which sometimes we're like, he's not eating my shoes anymore. Yay, we have finally gotten to that point. Um, but oftentimes is that the, these animals, their, their daily routine may be a little bit less. They may be spending, this is my own dog, Inja. That's when she was three and she was on vacation in Utah. And this, you know, and the couch is her, or the chair is her friend. Um, now, to be fair, with Inja, the chair was always her friend. <laughs> but, um, uh, but she does spend more time in it. You know, and, um, you know, if there's nothing going on, she does not go out and make her own trouble anymore. She's like, I, I'm going up on my chair. Yeah, let, let the German Shepherd get into trouble these days. I'm, I'm going to go sleep on the chair. 
Um, and so what, what we're going to start talking about now is many of these things are on a spectrum. You know, we have these normal and expected changes, but where do we tip over to, oh, this is not right. We need to seek intervention or we need to seek help. Where is this now becoming a problem? And so we're going to talk about red flags, things, things that we want to be on the watch for. We've got the obvious things, and these are, these are true for any age, right? The things on this list are pretty much no-brainers. If we have an animal that's, that's vomiting and can't hold down food or water, obviously we're going to seek help. Diarrhea, if it's ongoing or severe in particular. Uh, obviously refusing to eat or drink, growths or masses, coughing, lameness, sudden onset of lethargy or weakness. Obviously, you know, these are all things that you know, we, we all know we need to, to get them in. With senior animals, though, then we have the not so obvious. Anybody worried about anything with this particular cat? What's that? Yeah, do you notice his coat? He is not grooming. He's not grooming. A scruffy cat is, you know, especially one that has always been well groomed, that is a, that is a sign. That is a sign that something's going on with that cat. Anything else you notice with this cat? He's thin. Yeah. Now, we see this all the time in, in the office where people will come in and this is, you know, Rufus and he's 13 years old and he's here for a rabies vaccine. The owner got their little postcard and they bring him in and, hey, here's Rufus. We're here for our regular annual. And we look at Rufus and we're like, ooh, and we weigh Rufus and we're like, well, you know, Mrs. Smith, Rufus is down a pound and a half from the last time we saw him. And the most common response we get is, oh, you know, we thought he was getting a little thin, but, you know, he's old. He's old. Well, yes, and he's down a pound and a half. <laughs> so, and when you only weigh 11 pounds to begin with, mm, that's a lot. So I talked about in very elderly animals, we may have a slight decrease in muscle mass. This is not what we're talking about here. Weight loss that is significant or progressive is a huge red flag, especially since this is often the only sign that something is going wrong, especially in cats, because they be sneaky that way. So, and it's not uncommon that I will be talking to someone and say, okay, you know, this weight loss is a red flag for us. We really want to start looking for things. And like, but he's eating, he's running around, he's fine, you know, he's, everything's fine. And he's lost a pound and a half. So animals, especially cats, do not show signs of illness for a long time. And, um, and that's, that's just the way they are. And so, but they can't hide weight loss. So for us, that, that is a big, big red flag. So what can significant or progressive weight loss indicate? Well, the list is really, really long, but these are some of the usual suspects. Now, I want to say something quick about diabetes. You'll notice diabetes is going to be on a lot of the lists that I have today. Diabetes, quite frankly, the most common age range that we diagnose diabetes is middle-aged animals, not seniors. We do diagnose it in seniors. You know, they can, absolutely can get it, but it is not necessarily a senior disease. So it's going to be, it's on my list, but not necessarily a senior disease. We do diagnose it in seniors, but the, the middle-aged guys are the ones that, that um, uh, seem to be most at risk. So, you know, the usual suspects, kidney disease, liver disease, hyperthyroidism in cats. Let me say something quick about thyroid disease. A lot of you may already know this, but when we talk about thyroid disease in animals, cats get hyperthyroidism or elevated thyroid. Hypothyroidism or low thyroid, it has been documented in cats. It is extremely rare, extremely rare. Dogs get hypothyroidism, low thyroid. Hyperthyroidism has been documented in dogs, almost always associated with a thyroid cancer, which is very, very rare. So again, a lot of you may know that, but as we're throwing around thyroid during the day-to-day, -day, um, elevated thyroid cats, low thyroid with dogs. Low thyroid in dogs does not cause weight loss. <laughs> um, intestinal disease, especially inflammatory bowel disease, which is a particularly sneaky and silent disease, Inadequate calorie intake. One of the things, if we see significant weight loss, one of the things we ask is, have you, have you changed the food lately? Sometimes it's that simple. They're like, oh, yeah, we changed brands four months ago, and it turns out that that brand of food has half the calories per whatever than the stuff they were feeding before. It can be that simple. Um, cancer, of course, is always on the list with geriatrics, which is sad but, but true. So 
significant or progressive weight loss, this, this, these are the usual suspects, and of course there are many other things that could be. What about dental disease as a cause of weight loss? What do you think? No. 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 They will find a way to eat. They will find a way to eat. And we'll talk about periodontal disease uh, later, but think of it this way. The best way I ever had it explained to me was this. An animal with a painful mouth has one problem. An animal with a painful mouth that's not eating now has two problems, and the not eating will kill him. Animals will eat with painful mouths. We'll talk about this more when we get to periodontal disease, but animals do not lose weight because of bad mouths. I, can it happen? Yes, I've seen it twice in 24 years. That I know that that was the cause. That I know for sure that that was the cause. But otherwise, we are finding other things. Yeah? So how do you know if they're having pain? We're going to talk about that. Yeah, we're, we're going to talk about periodontal disease and periodontal pain in particular. Yeah. Um, OK, so that was weight loss. This is weight gain. When I first saw this picture, I was really hoping they had just like widened it out until I looked at the space between his eyes. <laughs> yeah. So this is, I'm really hoping this guy has a thyroid problem. Um, so to be honest, most weight gain in seniors is because of too many calories and not enough exercise. Or with cats, a diet that is too high in carbs, which basically is dry food, which gets us on a whole different topic. Um, and uh, because we're talking seniors, this is often complicated by mobility and pain issues, which we're going to be talking a lot about today. So we may have an animal that was kind of overweight, a little, not too bad, and now he's got arthritis. And he's not exercising as much, he's not moving around as much, but he's eating the same amount. So he, that animal can quickly become obese. And now we have a huge complicating problem. So um, however, if there are other symptoms, we can have animals that are gaining weight on the scale. You know, they can go up you know, a pound, or I've seen some big dogs go up five or six pounds, but they're losing muscle mass. They're gaining weight, but they're losing muscle mass. That's a problem. There's something going on with those guys. Um, or if they have poor coat, recurring skin or ear infections, this is where low thyroid can come in in dogs. Um, Cushing's disease, possible. Other endocrine or glandular diseases, possible. Any disease that causes accumulation of fluid, or abnormal tissue in the abdomen. Um, heart failure can cause a lot of fluid buildup in the abdomen. Uh, cancer, of course, and abdominal mass can, can, do, can cause um, uh, weight gain as well. Um, so not something we deal with a ton um, in terms of disease, but we will talk about um, just plain old overweight a little bit later. Um, changes in appetite. Um, decreased appetite, of course, is something that you know, we see quite a lot of. And if the animal's refusing to eat, again, that's kind of a no-brainer. But this can be subtle. This can actually be subtle, where people are coming in and we're asking about the appetite, and they're like, well, he's eating, but they have started to notice some changes. And so things that we look at, if you have a dog or a cat that has always been a chow hound and reliably finishes up the food, but now is leaving some behind, that can be, that can be a, a, a tip-off. If they've always been on the same food, and they've always seemed to like it, and now they're starting to turn up their nose at it, that can be a red flag. What usually happens then is the owner goes and tries another food. They're like, well, he's been on this for a few years now. He's, he's just tired of it. And they go get a new food. And the animal's like, woohoo, yay. And they eat it fabulously for two days or a week. And then the owner finds themselves going back to the store to get something else. And then the owner finds out, they, they, they come to us and they're like, we've been through every food in the store, and now he'll eat if I put on this canned stuff with some tuna and, and sprinkle a little something, something, you know, bonito flakes on it and feed him by hand. You know, okay, now we're at this, is, and the animal is still eating, but there's definitely, obviously, a decrease in appetite. There's something going on. Be aware that many of these animals are still eating treats just fine. Yeah. Um, because they're not 100%, they're not, they're not feeling all that great. Their regular food is like, uh, but uh, milk bone, yeah I'll, uh, yeah, I'll take that, you know. So, um, but we don't want them to get to the point where they're absolutely refusing completely. These, these are tip-offs that there's something going on. And, of course, it's a nonspecific sign, so it's just a sign to us that we just need to start looking. Increased appetite. Do you think, wow, yay. Um, but 
if we have an animal that's acting ravenous, begging for food, stealing food, one of my hyperthyroid cats, before I diagnosed her, actually swiped a sandwich off my plate, almost <laughs> practically out of my hand. Uh, she was breaking into things. She chewed through a bread loaf bag and was starting eating, eating the bread. I mean, they can be amazing. You, we started hearing about behavior like that in the cat. That cat is hyperthyroid <laughs> until proven otherwise. Diabetes, of course, can do that. Cushing's disease, and there's a few other things that can cause increased appetite. Yes, ma'am. Cushing's disease. Cushing's disease, thank you, is it's um, a disease of the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands produce um, natural steroids, cort cortisone. And in Cushing's disease, they're producing way too much. If anyone has ever had to take cortisone, like prednisone, you know it can make you feel like you're starving all the time. Natural cortisones do the same thing. So if your adrenal gland is pumping out a whole bunch of natural steroids, way more than the body needs, then these animals are ravenous. They're hungry. Polyuria polydipsia. This is just the technical term for peeing a lot and drinking a lot. They usually go hand in hand because if you're peeing a lot, you have to drink more to keep up, to keep from getting dehydrated. If you're drinking a ton, you have to pee more. Again, this can be a little bit subtle. If you have that dog who's like peeing rivers on your floor, that's fairly obvious. But, but in the early stages, this can be subtle. So are you having to fill the water bowl more than usual? And sometimes people are like, yeah, you know, I usually fill it up once a day, but now I'm, I'm having to fill it like two or three times a day. I'm finding it empty, where I never used to find it empty before. Is the animal seeking water from unusual places? Dogs that never used to drink out of the toilet, and now it's like any time the seat is up, they're there. Cats that never used to drink out of the faucet. Now, there are some cats who drink out of the faucet, and they love drinking out of the faucet. If that's something they've done all their lives, that's fine. But they've never done it before, but they hear the sink running, and they're running to come to it. Or they have a sudden interest in everyone's water glasses, and they're shoving their heads in the water glasses. Or you're walking your dog, and of course, dogs drink out of puddles, but it's like he has to stop at every single puddle and drink out of every puddle. A well -bro housebroken animal that is now having urinary accidents. Or a dog that's getting you up in the middle of the night where they never used to before. Or cats, if they have indoor litter boxes, real uh, uh, telling sign is what are the size of the urine clumps? And I'm always demonstrating to my clients, oh, the average urine clump is anywhere from here to here. you know. But a, a, a cat that is polyuric can swamp out a whole corner of a litter box or one end of a litter box where we're getting urine clumps that are like this. So that's a really, really, so if you have cats and you're, you're cleaning out the litter box, get used to the average size of the urine clump. That's something to just kind of pay attention to. And again, uh, a lot of the usual suspects here as well can be as simple as a urinary tract infection. Um, of course, kidney disease, liver disease, again, hyperthyroidism in cats, again, diabetes, Cushing's disease with all those extra uh, steroid hormones or other uh, hormonal or endocrine diseases. Chronic pain in dogs. Chronic pain can cause excess water intake. Um, it's not a super common sign, but we do see it. And there's, there's a bunch of other things that can go along with it, but those are the most common. One thing I want to say about urinary incontinence. Now, there's having accidents in the house, where the, the, and these are usually dogs, where they are you know, peeing, and they're awake, and they know they're peeing, and it's just like, I, you know, no one's letting me out, and I have to pee, so I'm going to pee. And then there's incontinence where the animal is asleep or resting. They don't know they're peeing, but you're finding urine puddles in their bedding or your bedding, depending <laughs> on where they are, or the couch or wherever it is that they happen to be lying down. When we see incontinence, and here I'm talking, this most commonly happens in elderly female dogs. Elderly female dogs can have problems with their urinary sphincters, the muscle that holds the, the urine in the bladder. And in a lot of elderly female dogs, that, that sphincter muscle, it's hanging in there. It's getting a little tired, but it's hanging in. It's doing its job. It's showing up to work every day. And now you've got a dog that's drinking twice as much water, so you've got twice as much urine volume. Or this dog gets a bladder infection, and now the whole bladder and the muscle is inflamed. And this poor little muscle is like, I'm trying, but never mind. I just, I give up. I'm going back to bed, and now you have incontinence. Now, when people, many people, when they have an incontinent female dog, what, is, what do a lot of people say? She's getting old. She's getting old. When actually there's an actual medical problem going on. It may be as simple as a urinary tract infection. There may be an underlying medical condition. 
So we have people saying, you know, my, my dog's, you know, peeing the bed. I need medicine for that. Mm, we need to at least do a urinalysis first and make sure that there's not a UTI or that, you know, if this dog's producing a ton of dilute urine, why? Is there kidney disease? Is there something else going on? We need to get to the bottom of it. To be aware, they can have both at the same time, uh, a medical problem and incontinence. This is where, with geriatric stuff, things just start to pile on, and things can start looking very confusing. So we just need to kind of tease out the, the tangles and figure it out. Mobility and pain, big, 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 big topic. The vast majority of our senior animals, if they get old enough, they're going to start having mobility and pain issues. And of course, this is an enormous quality of life issue. Um, and for big breed dogs especially, many of them will be euthanized for mobility and pain issues rather than disease, rather than some kind of cancer or kidney disease or something. It's, it's mobility and pain that's going to be their end of life issue. Arthritis is extremely common in both dogs and cats, but the signs can be extremely subtle and hard to pick up on. It's especially overlooked in cats. I remember hearing in vet school, long, long time ago, cats don't get arthritis. Well, someone finally did a study looking, radiographing cats over 15 years of age. And the result was surprising to veterinarians, let alone everybody else, that over 90% of cats over 15 years of age actually have arthritis. They just don't show recognizable signs of it. So we need to really, really look. And we, in elderly cats over 15, I just presume they have arthritis. And we start to have to talk, talk, talking about mobility and pain with, with people. And be aware that, that there can also be neurologic issues, especially with dogs, rarely with cats, but especially with dogs, especially with big breed dogs. They can be really prone to a couple of issues that create neurologic problems, especially to the rear legs. And they can have that with arthritis. So again, this is kind of where we have multiple issues kind of piling on each other. So this is, again, a very, very common scenario where we have you know, an animal coming in, annual exam, wellness exam. We're here to get the rabies vaccine. And I come in the room, and this, this dog is doing what I call the little old man walk, like this. And I say, well, how, how is he getting around? Oh, he's OK. OK. And, you know, we start asking specific questions. Can you do this? Can you do that? And we start doing our exam. We find out he's got ouchy hips, and he's got an ouchy back, and he's got an ouchy elbow. And we start talking about pain. And many people say, well, he's not in pain. You know, he may have arthritis, but he's not in pain. And this, again, comes back to a really, really um, us not recognizing signs of pain. And, and because what do people do when we're in pain? OK, people, we are weenies, number one. Something hurts, I'm like, <laughs> you know, and people are, if you, if you want to consider us domestic animals, people are the only domestic animal for which whining and crying gets you a positive response, <laughs> OK? Because we're social like that. If we go, woohoo, and then you're like, oh, it's, oh, yeah, we need to get you to the doctor or whatever, or kiss the boob or whatever. Look at it from an animal's point of view. If they are in chronic, especially chronic pain, what is whining and crying going to do for them? It's going to bring them to the notice of animals who are not in chronic pain. And that may be the last day that they're whining about it. Okay? <laughs> animals do not have the resources to get a positive response for whining and crying about chronic pain. No one is going to say, oh, let's take it. Well, I mean, we are the ones who are going to take them to the doctor, but they didn't evolve with us. You know? So for their hardwiring, there is an absolutely no advantage to letting anybody know that they're in pain. And there's nothing they can do about it. So they just suck it up and live with it. So we are expecting them to cry. And this is we hear this over and over again from owners. But he doesn't cry. He's not going to cry. So we need to look for other signs. So what are we looking for? Now lameness, now that was on my no-brainer list, right? Lameness, if you're lame in one leg, is really obvious. If you're lame in two, three, or four legs, if the animal's going, ow, 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 what does it look like to the owner? Looks very symmetrical, right? And the animal's not whining or crying. We see animals all the time, they're lame in all four legs. But the owner can't tell. So what do we look for? We look for stiffness. I, and I, I imitate this for owners all the time, that this is a little old man walk, little old lady walk, you know, where we were just doing this. 
And they're like, oh, yeah, he does do that. You know, he's not striding out like the three-year-old anymore. He doesn't have the range of motion anymore. So, you know, he's, he's got a, a, a short, choppy gait um, where things are, things are just, you know, real stiff. Stumbling or falling in the rear legs. Now, if they're actually falling, that's pretty obvious. But one more subtle thing I have people watch for is if they're, especially in the rear legs, if the animal's taking a turn, sometimes they'll just cross those rear legs and they'll stumble a little bit. Or they will start dragging a foot. Now, those two, the stumbling and the dragging, that can be either pain or it can be neurologic. And they can look identical. Um, bunny hopping with both rear feet, especially when, when dogs are running or trying to go upstairs where they're using both hind feet at the same time. They're pushing off with both hind feet simultaneously because it hurts since they, they, need, they need the help of both feet at the same time. Irritability, again, me, herniated disc, flaring up. If I'm trying to go from here to there, you do not want to get in my way. <laughs> you do not want me to have to stop or turn or anything that's going to aggravate my back. Um, and my boyfriend has mentioned that the, 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 the level of you know, sharp tones in our house goes up a little bit. He can always tell when, when my back is hurting. And this is true how many senior animals are just like, they start to lose patience. They don't want the other animals up in their face anymore. They don't want the kids you know, pulling on their ears anymore or jostling them. They just, they're like, I'm trying to get from here to my water bowl. Do not get in my way. Uh, and again, overall decreased activity. And again, we're on that spectrum. Yeah, you know, can be normal, but if this is an animal that's sleeping all the time, that can be an escape from pain. So we need to look at that. This is what we look for. In case this didn't think, you thought this list wasn't long enough, I have more. Is there difficulty? And this is what this, I have people specifically watch for this. Um, difficulty getting up and down, especially after exercise. Because people say, yeah, we go to the, but she goes to the park, she does great. Of course she does. Because she's at the park, smells, sounds, yay. Go home. You know how dogs crash when they get home, right? And they go down for their nap. It's like, ugh, that took it out of me. You want to watch them when they get up from that nap. That's where you're going to see it. Because that's when they're going to be stiff. If they have arthritis, that's when they're going to stiffen up is when they've been resting after exercise. And again, anybody here with arthritis knows what that feels like. You know, you get up and you're like, ah, yeah, okay, ah, now we're going, all right. You know, and you warm out of it after a minute. And when I describe that to people, they're like, yeah, that's exactly what she does. That's, we have, we have an issue going on. That's, that animal's in pain. Um, again, going up and down the stairs, jumping onto the furniture, getting in the car, these are all things the animal's having difficulty with. Very advanced is, you know, when the animal's really, really having difficulty is that they may have trouble getting into position to urinate or defecate. Male dogs may be like, okay, I'm not lifting my leg anymore. That is just not worth it. Um, <laughs> and they're going to start squatting. And, and sometimes even to have bowel movements where they're out and they're just kind of teetering, you know, because they have trouble with that position. And in case you thought that wasn't a long enough list, we have more. So you'll notice everything on this slide has a red asterisk because these are not specific to pain. These can all indicate other issues as well. Increased panting with dogs when it's not hot. You know, someone in January is like, oh, he's panting all the time. Could indicate something else. We're sure going to listen to that dog's heart and lungs really, really well. Um, but this could be pain. Drinking excessive water, like we mentioned. Uh, lagging on walks or unable to walk as far, just losing stamina. Again, we're going to listen to heart and lungs really, really well, make sure there's no metabolic disease going on, but this could just be pain. Increased vocalization in cats. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later. Rough, ungroomed coat. These cats are like, I hurt. I can't get around there to, to lick, you know, everywhere. So it's just going to have to take care of itself. Missing the litter box, and we'll talk about that really specifically later. Overgrooming particular areas, particularly over joints, but not necessarily. So again, these can all indicate other issues, but they can be problems with pain as well. So many times, you know, the owner is suspecting there may be something wrong, but they're not really sure. That's where we get in, we get our hands on the animal, we check range of motion, we watch how they walk, we get a history, what can they do, what are you noticing at home? And if it's looking like, yeah, this could be pain, let's try some pain meds. Since we can't ask them, let's just try the pain meds and see if we get a, see if we get a difference with that. Okay, we're gonna go into behavioral changes. 
more red flags. Lethargy. Now we talked about decreased activity. What's the difference between decreased activity and lethargy? To me, it's the difference between my dog, okay, she loves her chair, she's on her chair. I pick up the leash, she's off that chair in a shot, you know? I come in the room, she's in her chair, she's like, hey, like, hey. Like, you want to go out? Yeah! Jumps off the chair, let's go out, woohoo! You know, there's still that zest, you know? It's like, okay, you know what? Nothing's going on, I'm taking a nap. This sun right here, just whatever. Oh, there's something happening? Food, snacks, chocolate chip cookies, you know, walks, we're there. Lethargy is like, ah, that's okay. Nah, walk, mm, all right, not really. You know, yeah, I'll come eat, but mm. And again, this can be really, really subtle. It is not uncommon that people will bring their animals in and, and they'll, they'll often say something like, I may be completely stupid, but I just think there's something wrong. And we go through the usual, you know, any, no vomiting, no diarrhea, eating fine, going on walks and everything. And they're like, there's just, there's something off. There's just, there's something, I can't put my finger on it. There's just, he's not 100%. We take that extremely seriously. The last two dogs that were brought to me with that kind of history, we found abdominal masses in both of them. And one of them was non-operable. One of them was operable. And that dog is alive and kicking a year and a half later. So, and there was nothing else, nothing else. By the time that thing would have made itself clinically obvious, it would have been too late. So go with your gut on this, and we will take you seriously. Um, excessive vocalization in cats. Has anyone ever lived with a cat who does this? <laughs> and I'm not talking like the Siamese who do it all the time. But these are elderly cats. They can vocalize at any time of the day or night, but it tends to be worst at night. Yeah. That's why. <laughs> I don't know exactly why they're doing it. Well, hyperthyroidism. Cats are nocturnal. Cats are nocturnal. They hang out during the day with us and sleep at night because that's the, the rhythm of the household. But anyone who's ever raised kittens, as I'm sure all of you have, kittens, they're like, no, 3 o'clock in the morning is a fabulous time to play. Um, so they just kind of get used to our, our routine, but they are nocturnal. Um, so excessive vocalization, the four usual suspects on this, there are other things, but the four most common things, hyperthyroidism, pain, cognitive dysfunction, also called senile dementia, hypertension, high blood pressure can do this. So we're going to go down the list and we're going to rule those out one by one. Cognitive dysfunction. So when people started looking at doing studies to find out how prevalent this is, it is pretty common. Uh, in dogs, uh, uh, the, the biggest study that was done on this found that dogs 11 to 12 years of age had at least one sign consistent with cognitive dysfunction. By the time they were 15 to 16 years of age, almost 70% had at least one sign of cognitive dysfunction. In cats, it was a different study, so it was structured a little differently. They looked at cats 11 to 15 years of age, 28% had at least one sign. By the time you get up over 15, half of them. Um, so what are the signs? Confusion. Many times these animals are getting lost in their own house or lost in their own yard. Something I've seen quite a bit is when you have a, an open door and it's open, you know, and it's parallel with the wall, where the animal may get in between the door and the wall and not be able to figure out how to get out. They may get stuck in corners and not be able to figure out how to get out of a corner or behind a chair or under a table. Um, loss of housebreaking is very, very common. Constant pacing or wandering. When these animals come in, and this is where we're getting fairly advanced cognitive dys dysfunction, but they come into the exam room and they are con they're like little Energizer bunnies. You know, they cannot stop and they hit a wall and they just change direction and keep going. They come to me, hit me, and keep going. And you reach down, you pet them, and they're like, ah, oh, what? You know, and then they just keep going. Altered social interactions. Many times they don't really want to be petted anymore. The owners describe a loss of connection. They look in the eyes and they're just, they're just it's like he's not there anymore. They may start to withdraw into themselves. It's like they're living in their own world at that point. We can also have anxiety. These animals can be very, very anxious where owners say, you know, he doesn't want to be petted, but he won't leave me alone. He's following me around from room to room, and I try and console him, but many owners are describing this as the animal being inconsolable. 
altered sleep-wake cycles, both dogs and cats. In humans, this is called sundowner syndrome. We use the same term in dogs and cats, where they are pacing, barking, vocalizing, wailing all night long. This becomes a quality of life issue for the owner as well. We, I've had people break down into tears in my exam room because I, I have not slept. I have to sleep. Um, onset tends to be gradual over many months to years. Um, with cognitive dysfunction, this is a quality of life issue, especially if these, if these animals are very anxious, um, especially if they seem trapped in their own world. Um, and so there are some medications that may help. Um, people have worked with essential fatty acids that may help. Um, there are things that we can, we can try. Anti-anxiety medications may help. Um, basically, what we're trying to do with animals with cognitive dysfunction is recognize it and, and try things that, that are just going to help this animal's quality of life, help them um, feel comfortable, not anxious, and keep going as long as they can. So. So we're going to switch up a little bit. Those are the big red flags. We're going to talk about wellness care. And along with that, we're going to talk about the big red flags we talked about. We're going to talk about what do we do? And what are, what are some things that, how do we keep our animals healthy? How do we keep them uh, as happy as we can? That's my cat, Molly. And I don't know if you can see, but she has, she's 13 years old. She has her reading glasses right there. I just walked in my office. She was curled up with my reading glasses. So now, now she's on Facebook as Editor Kitty. She's, she's now Editor Kitty. Um, so first thing, we talked about weight loss, we talked about weight gain, we talked about loss of muscle mass, and muscle wasting. How do we know? How do we assess body condition? What do you guys think about this dog? Probably a little over. Not unusual for me to walk into an exam room and the only, first thing the owner will say is, she's 76 pounds today, is that too much? <laughs> I don't know. Lesson being, you got to get your hands on them. The number on the scale can be very, very useful. And if I have previous weights, and I saw this dog last year and she was 66 pounds, and yeah, 76 is probably not going to be a happy place. Um, but the number itself doesn't tell me much until I get my hands on that animal. And so what are we looking for specifically? Um, there's a number of different things you can look at, but this is, this is what I teach people. Ribs. This is my dog, Inja. She was kind of a re little reluctant uh, model there. She's like, I really don't want to be here. Um, we want to be able to feel the ribs, and this is true for all ages, from puppyhood and kittenhood up. You want to be able to feel the ribs easily. You should be able to play the piano with those ribs. You should be able to easily distinguish between one rib and the next, but you shouldn't be able to see them. If you can see the ribs, they're way too thin. Now, in a lot of lean dogs, if they move a certain way, you'll see that last rib kind of poking out a little bit, but you shouldn't see all the ribs. So easily feeling the ribs. If you're starting to lose that distinction between one rib and the next, there's probably a little bit too much padding between your fingers and the ribs. If you're feeling over the ribs and you're like, they're under there somewhere, <laughs> then, then we have an issue. The other place to feel is the spine. I don't know if you guys can see um, that red line going down there. That's, that's Inge's backbone. You should be able to feel the bumps of the spine very easily. You shouldn't be able to see them, except like in sight hounds, you might be able to see just a little, little bit. But you really shouldn't be able to see them. You should be able to feel them easily. And next to the spine on either side run the big, big lumbar or back muscles. And those should be, you should get the sense when you press down on those that they are thick and happy and really, really present. So a lot, of, a lot of times what I show my owners is when you're petting an animal, dog or cat, doesn't matter what size, and you run your hand down their back, your hand is usually going to take this kind of shape with the backbone here and big straps of muscle on either side, right? So it's going to be kind of this shape. If the animal is losing significant amounts of weight, they're going to be doing what we call muscle wasting. They're going to be losing that muscle mass in a significant way. What's going to happen to the muscle on either side? Your hand's going to start taking on this shape because that muscle is now gone and the backbone is sticking up. And there's, no, there's very little muscle on either side. So if your hand is taking on that steeple shape, that's a red flag. That animal's got muscle wasting. There's something going on. Um, 
Weighing. Now, we definitely want to be weighing our animals because it's not a replacement for body condition evaluation, but it helps us if we have weight we need to lose or weight we need to gain. We need some objective way of measuring that. That's where the scale comes in. The one thing you want to be aware of, bathroom scales are not adequate for small dogs and for cats. I don't care if they're digital. They're not accurate enough. You need a baby scale. And if you're doing this at home, which I strongly encourage my owners to do, especially if we're doing a um, weight loss program um, or with cats, cats either way, up or down, we need baby scales. At our hospital, and many hospitals are the same, people can make a tech appointment, come in for a weight recheck, we do it for free. But a lot of people don't want to be coming in every two or three weeks with their cats. You know, it's just, it's stressful for the cats and it's hard on their schedule. So baby scales. And a tip I picked up from a client that I tell everybody now, my client figured out, she's like, you know, people have babies and the babies grow up. Yeah, what happens to the baby scales? Craigslist. Craigslist. That's it. You want a baby, and I've told all my clients this afterward that, that we're in this situation, and they find used baby scales on Craigslist. So for cheap. It's great. Um, nutrition, senior nutrition. Yes. This is a can of worms. For, for, this, is, this is the reason is there is no veterinary or veterinary nutritionist consensus on what makes an optimum senior diet. There is none. There is no consensus among pet food manufacturers as to what makes a senior diet. So one brand's senior diet can be radically different from another brand's senior diet. You ask the experts, and there's a, lot, there's a few general recommendations, and a lot of it depends. You ask the pet food manufacturers, and there you get a lot of marketing, which meant much of which is not centered in actual data. So it makes it very, very confusing, very hard to know what to do. One thing we run into a lot is people think, saying, well, but isn't it true that senior animals need lower protein and fewer calories? No. Some senior animals may need lower protein and fewer calories, but you cannot make a blanket recommendation because that will not be appropriate for most senior animals. So where does that leave us? It is, what, I, what we have found is that it's helpful to think of the senior animal population in, in like four big categories. And the first category or scenario is we have a healthy senior has no diagnosed medical conditions, doing well, this is what I mean by healthy, no current medical issues or diseases, maintaining good body condition, not overweight, not underweight, they're on a good quality food already. Most of us do not see a need to change that animal. We're not going to arbitrarily put that animal on a senior diet. My dog, Inja, 13 years old, is rocking her royal canine. So she's in good shape. It's working for her. I'm not going to put her on a senior diet. She doesn't need any arbitrary thing. Second category, what if we have an animal who is losing significant amounts of, of body weight, especially muscle wasting? Well, obviously, first thing we're going to do, like we talked about, we're going to look for problems. If we don't find problems, and if this, remember I talked way in the beginning about some animals, they, when they get older, they start to, their metabolism becomes less efficient. And if we have a very elderly animal that has a mild loss of muscle mass, that animal, if we don't find anything else, may benefit from a higher protein or higher calorie food. But we can't, this is where we're getting into, we can't make blanket recommendations. This has to be done on an individual basis. If we have third category, we have an animal who is diagnosed with a medical condition. Many medical conditions that seniors get are what we call diet sensitive, meaning that we can try and optimize our outcome or optimize our management of that condition with diet. Uh, diabetes, uh, especially in cats. Constipation, uh, which is, uh, we see in both species, but especially in cats as well. Interesting, there's no blanket recommendation for that. Some do better on higher fiber. Some do better on low fiber. Some do better on something else. It just depends. Kidney disease, inflammatory bowel disease, arthritis, cognitive dysfunction. These are things that, that dietary intervention or supplements or, or some kind of different diet may help. Again, 
This has to be tailored to the individual. Not every animal with kidney disease should or has to go onto a prescription kidney diet. So we're going to evaluate that individual animal and its needs. And then the last category, we may have a healthy senior who is overweight. And the problem with being a senior animal that's overweight, again, this is where we get a multiple piling on of issues, that's increased stress on those joints. And it leaves those animals at higher risk for injuries. Your basic sprains and strains, but also ruptured anterior cruciate ligament, which is that ligament in the knee. Many people have ruptured it. Dogs will rupture it as well. So will cats. Not as commonly, but they can. Herniated discs. Heavy animals, much higher risk for herniated discs. But over and above that, obesity has been recognized as a chronic inflammatory condition. Fat tissue is not inert. It produces hormones. It produces inflammatory substances. So obesity exacerbates arthritis, not just because of the excess weight, but because of the excess inflammatory substances that are being produced in the body. So it is considered a chronic inflammatory disease. And studies in dogs and cats have shown that this can either help with the development of or the exacerbation of a variety of different things, including heart disease, pancreatitis, diabetes, um, and more studies are ongoing. I want to talk a little bit about, especially about overweight or obese cats. And this is true of all ages, not just seniors, but this is some stuff, if you don't already know it, you kind of need to know. Overweight, you may already know this, overweight or obese cats have an absolute increased risk of diabetes. They develop insulin resistance. And an overweight cat has a two-time greater risk of diabetes. An obese cat has a four-time greater risk of diabetes. Um, overweight cats definitely have a higher risk of urinary issues. What I really want to emphasize is that overweight and obese cats have a much, much higher risk for a liver condition called hepatic lipidosis or also called fatty liver syndrome. And the reason I really, really want people to know this is because fatty liver syndrome is extremely serious. It can be triggered by a sudden loss of weight or just a sudden decrease in calories. So if we have an overweight or obese cat that becomes sick for whatever reason and, and stops eating or just decreases the amount they take in by 50% or more for as little as two to three days, that can trigger hepatic lipidosis. And hepatic lipidosis in and of itself, no matter what else started them not eating in the first place, hepatic lipidosis in and of itself, even with very aggressive treatment, is fatal in about 30% of cases. So we are extremely careful with overweight and obese cats. This is why we would never say to a client, OK, your cat's heavy. Get some weight off. See you later. We need to be really constructing a plan about how we're going to do this safely. And if people have cats that are overweight or obese, those cats have to eat. All cats have to eat. I mean, all, everyone has to eat. But, for these guys, it is of particular, particular importance. So this is why if we have a, a senior cat, say, that has kidney disease or something where, oh, it would be lovely to have them on kidney diet, we are never, ever going to do a my way or the highway. Where you put the food down, you're like, you're eating that, and you're not moving until you do. Because I tell you what, with dogs, dogs will do hunger strikes, but they're really kind of, you know, they don't really mean it. Cats mean it. And if they're not going to eat it, they're not going to eat it, and they will starve, and they will starve themselves right into hepatic lipidosis. And it does not take long to do. So if we're sending home a new, a new diet with clients, or we're putting them on, this cat on a weight loss regimen, one thing I always emphasize to that person is that if we're doing a very gradual, first of all, everything's very gradual. We don't do any sudden changes. And if as we're doing these changes, you find that this cat is not going to eat this food, definitely call me, but don't wait for me to call you back. You feed this cat whatever it will eat. Whether that's the old food or I don't care what, you feed him what it will eat. And then we'll figure it out. Um, so with overweight senior animals, it is easy to say, okay, go lose weight. You know, we're going to do this, we, you know, cut everything in half and uh, stop feeding the milk bones and start... You know, go for it, start going for it, runs, you know. Okay, 
We don't do that because these animals are in complicated situations, most of them. Many of them at this point already have arthritis. They already have mobility or pain issues. And so we try to take an integrative approach with this. Yes, we are, we are going to be restructuring the calories or cutting the calories back. Yes, we are going to be trying to do whatever exercise the animal can safely tolerate. And we're going to be doing comprehensive pain management, if that is indicated, which it is in most of these guys. So do we need veterinary supervision of weight loss because of all the mobility and pain issues that we're usually dealing with? For dogs, absolutely. I think it's a really, really good idea. I think it's critical for cats because of the issue with hepatic lipidosis. I, I want these cats. I'm, I want these cats under supervision. Um, there, is, there is a maximum safe rate of weight loss that they can have. We need to keep them under that. We are calculating how many calories they should be eating a day. We are monitoring these cats very, very, very closely. So, um, so of things, if people say, well, what can we prevent with nutrition or what can we do with nutrition? I'm going to tell you there's a lot of claims out there and there's a lot of claims that are not substantiated by anything. I will tell you what we know for sure. What we know for sure in dogs, if we maintain a lifelong lean body condition, dogs' lifespans go up by an average of 15%, and they will get the same diseases as their overweight counterparts, but they tend to get them up to three years later. Huge difference. Purina was the first one who did the first large-scale study on this, and they were not expecting to find this. And many studies since then have corroborated their findings. In cats, we know that maintaining a lean body condition by feeding a high-protein, low-carb, canned diet reduces the risk for diabetes. It probably also extends life. It probably also has a lot of other beneficial effects. Those studies either haven't been done or they are ongoing right now and they just haven't been published. So this speaks to the high-protein, low-carb can diet, of which I am an enormous proponent in cats. Dry food is not an appropriate diet for cats. That said, many cats will do okay on a canned diet. I have owned cats that did okay on a, can, on a dry diet. I had a cat who lived to be 16 and a half and was lean and mean all her life on dry food diet. That said, we know now high protein, low carb is what cats are meant to be eating. They are not small dogs. Vaccination. Um, all I have to say about vaccination is that age alone is not a reason not to vaccinate. With any age animal, vaccination and what we vaccinate for and all that should be an individual decision for that animal. We're looking at, especially seniors, we're looking at what concurrent diseases do we have. You know, if I have a 16-year-old cat in advanced kidney failure and, you know, muscle wasted and getting sub-Q fluids every day, I might stop giving the feline distemper vaccine at this point, you know. Um, but that's a conversation I'm going to have with the owner. So we're looking at current health issues. What vaccines are we talking about? What is the risk of exposure? What are the legal ramifications? And of course, here I'm talking about rabies. Multnomah County will not accept age alone as a reason not to vaccinate for rabies. If there is a diagnosed medical condition, okay, but not just because of age. Um, and the owner and the veterinarian need to come to a consensus. Hopefully everyone's kind of on the same page about what people feel is best for their animals and what, what the veterinarian is recommending. We really try to get to, the, at least in our hospital, we try to get to that consensus where everyone's feeling comfortable about what we're doing or not doing. Dental care. <laughs> Safe to say that the majority of our senior dogs and cats have significant periodontal disease. Probably 80% or more have significant periodontal disease. And when I say periodontal disease, I am not talking about tartar. Periodontal disease, like obesity, is a chronic inflammatory disease. On top of that, you now add chronic bacterial infection. And we have, and study after study has shown this in dogs and cats, we have serious ongoing impact to the overall health of the body, especially the heart, the liver, the kidneys. Not to mention, we now have another source of chronic pain, which someone asked about before. So... Signs of dental pain. The most common sign we have is decreased activity, slowing down. People see that, what do they say? He's getting old. 
I cannot tell you the number of animals, senior animals, that we have done periodontal treatments on, get them in, take care of all the, the teeth, pull the painful ones, pull the infected ones. They go home, they heal up. We call the owners to say, how is he doing? And they're like, this is like you took five years off my dog. It's like you took five years off my cat. He is running around. And then people feel bad. They're like, he was in pain and I didn't know it. So we are really proactive with our, with our patients. And I know our clients get tired of hearing it, but they will not show signs of dental pain. It's like we talked about before. You have dental pain, you have one problem. You have dental pain, you don't eat. Now you have two problems. And the second problem is going to kill you. So a few animals may show other signs. And certainly if we see this, we take it really seriously. Animals that are no longer playing with their chew toys. Um, every once in a while, we'll have an animal that acts head shy. And, most of, and that, that's just nonspecific. For, there's usually pain somewhere in the head and neck. That might be due to a tooth. It's usually due to something else, glaucoma or neck issues or something like that. But we definitely will look at the teeth. The obvious signs of dental pain where we may have animals that are chewing on one side of their mouth. You have to look carefully, but sometimes you'll see that. Dropping food when they're eating or pawing at the mouth, those are really, really rare. So dental cleaning and periodontal treatment, we, are, we don't care about making the teeth pretty. Honestly, the tartar you can see is not the tartar that's causing the problem. It's the stuff up under the gums. And that's why this requires general anesthesia. There are people that do what they call anesthesia-free dentistries, where they're scraping the, the obvious tartar off the teeth. That is not the tartar that's causing the problem. And so um, our goal is when we get in that mouth, we are going to do our best to eliminate every source of chronic inflammation, chronic infection, and pain. Because that will reverse or reduce that impact on that animal's health and will significantly improve that animal's quality of life if we can get rid of that chronic pain. Where people are really nervous, of course, is the anesthesia. And many people are nervous that their animal's going to lose teeth. So again, age alone is not a reason to deny periodontal treatment. But just like with vaccination, just like everything else, we're going to take this on a case-by-case -case basis. We are going to look at these animals. We're going to evaluate their hearts. We're going to look at pre-anesthetic blood work. We're looking for reasons not to go forward. We don't want to put animals through anesthesia if they're not going to make it through. So we are doing our best to identify any problems ahead of time. And when they come in, they're, at least I'm speaking now to my hospital. I can't speak for everyone, but this is what we do. We do a lot of dentistry at North Portland Animal Hospital. And the vast majority of these animals are geriatric. And we've been doing this for over 30 years, so we have a lot of experience with this. We are making an anesthetic plan that is individual for that animal. We are dosing them very, very carefully. Everybody gets an IV catheter and fluids that is non-negotiable. That is a safety issue for us. They are being monitored extremely closely while they're under anesthesia. We are doing comprehensive pain control. This is not just routine going in and scaling the teeth. If we're doing periodontal treatment, this does get involved. And th this is for the animal's safety and to be sure that we can do what, everything we need to do when we get in there. Everyone is also getting dental x-rays. And for us, that is also non-negotiable. We are going to x-ray that entire mouth because when we're in there, we don't want to identify every problem we can and take care of it because we don't want to have to anesthetize this animal again in three months or six months. So I picked these pictures. So this is very typical. Very, I don't know if you guys can see very, very advanced uh, periodontal disease here. Um, this is after the cleaning and prior to the extractions. And the reason I picked this picture is because I want you to notice what we're seeing here. Do you know what that is? Those are the roots. Those are the roots. Roots are supposed to be encased in bone. So what we're seeing here, this is what chronic infection over a number of years does to a mouth. There should be gum and bone down here. All that, not just the gum tissue, the bone has been eroded away from chronic infection. Do you think that's a comfortable mouth? No. That animal's been living with that for years. That animal is going to lose teeth. They're going to lose all those teeth. We're going to pull all those teeth. And this is where this speaks to, again, people are afraid their animal's going to lose teeth. And what we reassure people is that if we're pulling teeth, it's because those teeth are no longer functional. They are not doing their job. All they are is a source of pain and infection. And they need to come out. And this is why we take dental x-rays. So because this one is really, really obvious, 
But there are others where we take the x-ray and we can see the loss of bone on the x-ray and we know that tooth is going to be, it's going to be in this shape in another six months and we're going to just go ahead and pull it. Um, there are some animals that we can't do anesthesia. There are some senior animals. I have a little, if I have a little 16-year-old dog come in and he's in, you know, grade four heart failure and his kidneys aren't doing all that swell, you know, and we're just kind of hanging on, you know, I'm not going to do anesthesia probably on that animal, you know. So um, then we're talking about what can we do? What can we do to improve quality of life? Do we need pain medications? Do we need pulse antibiotic therapy? Do we need some you know, oral care that the owner can do at home? What can we do to make this animal feel better? Mobility and pain management. I'm going to talk about dogs and then cats. Um, so we talked about some of this already. But when I mentioned our toolbox earlier, this is kind of our toolbox that we, that we work with. We've talked about weight management. We've talked about exercise a little bit. And I'm going to start hitting these down here. Supplements. The, these are nutritional supplements. Uh, the most common being, it's not limited to this, but the most common being glucosamine and chondroitin. And I know there's been a lot of studies in people that says, oh, that's nonsense. Nonsense. We've done the studies. It makes no difference whatsoever. We've been using glucosamine and chondroitin in animals long before human medicine did. It started in racehorses over 25 years ago. And then we started using it in dogs. And I'll tell you what, the thing about animals, they don't have a placebo effect. They don't know it's supposed to feel better because, you know, they got a pill. So not all animals respond to these, but we see a number of animals, especially early in the disease process with arthritis, that will respond very nicely to glucosamine chondroitin. Essential fatty acids. Now, not all essential fatty acids are made alike, and a lot of people will add, like, olive oil to the food, or I talked to someone yesterday who was using sardine oil or salmon oil. What you want, you want... Uh, or they're using human products. You want one that's, that is formulated for dogs and cats. You want omega-3s. And what you're looking for in the label is EPA or DHA. EPA is the best. So they need a particular balance of omega-3s and omega-6s. They get almost all the omega-6s from their diet, so we want to supplement with omega-3s. Um, tons and tons of good quality stuff on the market with that. But make sure that, that you're, you're looking for this. So the, the upsides of supplements is that they're safe. This is great. They're not going to hurt anybody. We don't have to do blood work monitoring. There's no impact on the body. They're an important part of a comprehensive pain management program. The downsides, they don't treat pain directly. They're not pain medications. Um, in moderate to severe cases, they're not going to be doing it by themselves. Um, so they, need, they are really good either early on or then as added in with others. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication, the NSAIDs, this is probably the cornerstone of our toolbox. The biggest, this is the biggest uh, thing we have in our toolbox. The most common, Carperfin, which is Rimadyl, Novox, there's some generics out there now. Meloxicam, which is Medicam, there's generic. The generic human formulation can only be used in great, great, great big dogs because the tablet size is just too big for most everybody else. Deramax, and there's a few others. The pros, they are well tolerated and really effective in most dogs. The downside, when they're not effective, or I'm sorry, when they're not tolerated, they can really not be tolerated. So we use them carefully. We strongly recommend blood work. At our hospital, we would like to see blood work ahead of time. And senior animals, we want to make sure liver and kidneys are okay to start with. And then we're monitoring blood work periodically thereafter to make sure the liver and kidneys are handling them okay. Um, we also, there can be occasional stomach issues. Some animals cannot tolerate non-steroidals the same way some people can't. There can be stomach issues where we can have vomiting or diarrhea. In rare cases, you can actually have ulcers of the stomach. So, and then liver toxicity, most people have heard about that with Rimadyl. Um, about one out of every 10,000 dogs will develop um, liver, uh, liver toxicity that is reversible if caught in time but can be fatal. So we are careful with these drugs. We don't just you know, hand them out like candy. There's a lot of client education that goes along with this. We're using them carefully. But that said, I was in practice a long time before these things came on the market. And I tell you what, these, the, these drugs have saved a lot of lives. They have saved millions of lives at this point in terms of giving us good quality life, sometimes for years where we would, have be, we would have been euthanizing these animals. What about human anti-inflammatory meds? No. <laughs> Bottom line, no. They are, they are way too toxic, way too toxic. 
Um, so high, high risk of issues. And this includes aspirin. We used to use a lot of aspirin back in the day before we had all the other stuff. We still may occasionally use it. But a study that was done uh, uh, relative in the last few years looked at, at dogs taking aspirin at recommended doses, the doses we always used, um, and then scoping those dogs. These are dogs with no symptoms, no problems, seem to be taking it fine. Scope the stomachs. 100% of the dogs had bleeding damage in their stomachs. So we no longer routinely recommend it. Um, I, I will talk to people about it if we have to in certain cases, but I, myself now, I try, to st I try to stay away from it. Pain meds. Um, two big categories are narcotics, the most common of which is tramadol. We use a lot of tramadol. Codeine and morphine are we're saving for the really, really big guns. Um, and then non-narcotics, gabapentin is a very common one. There's a lot of others that we can use as well. The pros, they work really well with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories when we need additional pain management. Um, they are safe. We normally don't need to be doing blood work monitoring. Uh, animals will do very, very well on them. Downsides, they're not anti-inflammatories. So they oftentimes work better for more for soft tissue pain than musculoskeletal pain because they are not anti-inflammatory. But with an anti-inflammatory, they often do, that's when they're used best. If we have an animal that can't take an anti-inflammatory, we will use these. Um, but they may not do enough all by themselves. Most of them will cause some sedation or drowsiness, and we titrate the dose. Because the last thing you want is an arthritic, wobbly dog that now is, now I'm going to fall down the stairs because you just, you know, zonked me out. Alternative therapies. Fortunately, in this area, we have a lot of resources, <laughs> a lot of resources. Acupuncture. I am a believer in acupuncture the way I'm a believer now in high-protein, low-carb canned food because dogs do, and cats do not have a placebo effect. And I saw, when I saw patients going in working with good acupuncturists, good chiropractors, and saw the difference it made, I'm like, sign me up. Uh, massage, hydrotherapy, um, fabulous for dogs swimming so they don't have a stress on their joints. Alternative medicine, herbal medicine, Chinese medicine. Um, the main thing I tell people is that you want to be sure that the practitioner is specifically trained for that species. Because if they're not, they don't know what they're doing. So they need to be trained for that. Other considerations, ramps, of course. Be careful with ramps because, you know, if you have a tottery dog going up a ramp, you want to be with the dog so they don't fall off the ramp. Um, support harnesses. Fabulous. Yeah. In the last 15 years, the most common brands I see, Rough Wear, Blue Dog, Help Them Up. I'm sure there's others. But these are great for the big dog, especially if you have a bad back like I do. Because, yeah, we want to take care of the dog, but I also don't want my owners dying, you know, <laughs> being in traction. <laughs> So cats, you'll notice our toolbox is a little smaller. Um, weight management, exercise, supplements, pain meds, alternative therapies. Where are the NSAIDs? None that are FDA approved for long-term use because of issues with kidney damage and kidney failure. Cats are just laws unto themselves. They do everything differently. Um, special little creatures that they are. So no NSAID. Okay, supplements, essentially the same as dogs. Um, pain meds, we have fewer options because cats cannot take a lot of narcotics. Um, it makes them crazy. Um, but we use a lot of buprenorphine. We use a lot of gabapentin. There are some other pain meds that we use as well. Um, this is not meant to be an exhaustive list, but just to give you an idea of what's out there. Now, an interesting thing is, is for an anti-inflammatory, there's a medication called Serenia, which is an anti-nausea medication has been found to have anti-inflammatory effects completely different from non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. It is very safe for use in cats, and people are starting to use it for arthritis in cats. It is very early. We've tried a few cats on it. Some cats are doing fabulously. Some cats, it didn't seem to make a difference. It is out there. Nothing's been published yet, but people are starting to look at this. So just FYI. Uh, alternative therapies, you'll notice that hydrotherapy is not on the list. Uh, <laughs> if you want to go swim your cat, have fun with that. Um, laser, laser therapy should be on the list, though, as was mentioned before. Acupuncture, chiropractic, massage, alternative medicine, again, somebody who's trained and knows what they're doing with cats. The acupuncturists that I know, they say their basic requirement is that whether dog or cat, they have to be able to hold still for about 20 minutes. So 
Other considerations, a lot of people build little steps up to the bed so they don't have to you know, jump, things like that. Litter box management. And this is where I mentioned earlier, uh, cats missing the litter box for pain and mobility issues. Low sided so they can get into it. When I say accessible, what I mean is ideally a box on every level of the house. We have an, these elderly cats coming in and the owner's like, he's starting to pee outside the box. I'm like, okay, where's your box? In the basement. Where does the cat like to spend most of his time? On my bed on the second floor. Well, now it's time to, you need a litter box upstairs. Well, we've never had, I know, but <laughs> you know, he's, he's like this and you know, he, need, he can't run down two flights of stairs every time he needs to go to the bathroom. So this is an issue for him. And you'll understand when you get old. You know, you want someone to do this for you. So, <laughs> and excellent box hygiene, which means cleaning every day. And our, our client, I know it's a pain in the butt, but you know, we clean every day and, and, and just make, make things nice for them. There's a, a pre-made uh, one you can get in the store. A lot of people will just use a shallow pan. The cat doesn't care if it came with a label on it saying litter box. Uh, and here's a nice homemade option. And a lot of people are like, but he'll kick litter out. And I'm like, I know, I have my little itty bitty Molly with the glasses, seven pounds. She is a litter flinger. She can fling litter, I swear. So, you know, I don't know if you can see, but they have the carpet <laughs> down below here, the patch of carpet to catch the litter. Um, so, quality of life. So when we're talking quality of life, very, very common, common conversation we're having with people. Um, because people struggle with what is my animal's quality of life? Where are we at? We have, a, we have a lot of let's just assess where we're at kind of conversations. And the things we're looking at, all the things we've talked about, mobility and pain and infection and disease conditions and, and you know, all these things we're looking at, um, trying to sum up where is this animal. A lot of what we talk to people about is where is this animal in their, in their routine daily activities? Are there still things that this animal likes to do? Yeah, he may be 17 and sleeping a lot, but is he still interested in getting the cookies? Is he still come, you know, he, you know when he sees the leash, he's like, yeah, I can only do two steps, but I'm there. You know, cats, are they, if they're the cats that you have sun in your house and they follow the sun from window to window during the day, are they still doing that? You know, are they still grooming? Are they still interacting? Are they still cuddling up in bed at night? You know, what are, what are their usual daily activities and how much of that are they still doing? Are they still enjoying things? You know, the little, the little old dogs that they, they get outside in the yard and they're by gum, they're going to go and check all the places to see where the squirrels were and check everything out. You know, that's great. They are still enjoying that. Mobility, as we've been talking about, you know, if mobility is going down, how are we doing with our pain management? Are we, is this animal still able and willing to do something? Even if, and with dogs, we're going on walks, it's not going to be the two miles anymore. We go down to a mile, we go down to half a mile, we go down to the end of the block and back. We go out to the sidewalk strip. And then, you know, we may get to the point where we're, we can't do that. So we're, we're, we're monitoring that. Be aware that an animal's condition can change significantly from day to day. And this is really true when we're getting near the end. Um, whether there's a disease condition going on or mobility issues, it is not uncommon for people to call us and say, you know, I had a euthanasia schedule for tomorrow, but he is running around the backyard today barking at the neighbor. Great. He's having a really good day. Um, you know, and that may last for... 24 hours or 48 hours or the next two weeks, we don't know. We'll take it, you know. It's really hard. And so it's, it's very often a roller coaster. It puts people through a roller coaster of we don't know when and it might be tomorrow and it might be the next day. But, oh, look, now he's, he's begging for food. Okay. You know, so there's no right or wrong answer in terms of when. Um, we encourage people to call us and just let's just talk about it on the phone. What are you seeing? What are, what, what, is there anything we can help with? Is there anything to, that we can tell you to look for? Um, you know, and if we have an animal with a, with a disease condition, for example, if they have a cancer or if they have a kidney failure, we know what the end is going to look like. 
for those guys, and we can tell people if they stop eating or they start throwing up or they start doing these things, these are the things you're watching for. It can be really difficult with mobility, and I think that is one of the, one of the hardest things for owners, and I've been through it as an owner, where the animal is still sharp mentally, they're still eating, all their organ systems are working fine, but their body, their musculoskeletal system is failing them. And that can be absolutely gut-wrenching for owners because it's, and I hate to say it easier, but it's almost easier if you have a disease condition where you're like, okay, we know it's terminal, he's got cancer, we know when he stops eating, it's the end, it's clear. Mobility and pain is not clear, and this is where we're having a lot of conversations with people especially about quality of life, about activities, about how does your animal seem to feel? If they seem withdrawn and they don't want to be jostled, and they don't want to be touched and we can't make it better, that's not good quality of life. We start having people kind of keep track of good days and bad days. And when the bad days start to really outweigh the good days, then we may be getting near the end. So, um, so these, are, these all go into this discussion of, of quality of life. We did a monster talk. <laughs> we covered a lot of ground. Yeah.